Now you might think, well, so what? What did that let us do? Well, the short answer is a surprising amount. So I'd love you to, you, I asked you to prime up your computer before. Can you open it up? I'm going to show you one of the things we can do now that we have established uh, what we call the identity of complex numbers. What makes two complex numbers identical to each other? Are the real components the same? Are the imaginary components the same? On your computer, what I'd like you to go to is, and I picked a question, in exercise 1a, it's 10b. 10b? Yeah, question 10b, which I didn't assign to you before, so we're going to do it together. 10b. Have a read of question 10, look at what it's asking you to do, and then we'll have a look at b together. Just take a moment to read it. Do you have it there? Can you see it, right? So question 10. Uh, for A, B, C, D, however many questions there are, it says, re read that phrase there right at the top, the preface of the question, right? It says, by, by what? Equating. By equating the real and imaginary components, pause, it's talking about these things, right? By equating the real and the imaginary components of this equation, right? They want us to find out what the unknowns are. In this case, they're calling x and y rather than a and b. You'll see them just as frequently. Okay? By equating the real parts and the imaginary parts, work out what x and y are. So what's going on here? right? If you have a look at this, and you can go ahead and write it down. We're going to do this together. If you have a look at this equation, we're saying this thing is a complex number. Over here, once I expand and simplify this mess, will also be a complex number. If I'm saying that they're equal to each other, that means the real components have to be separately equal and the imaginary components have to be separately equal. Does that make sense? Let's have a go. Okay? So we're going to expand this guy out. It's mercifully simple. That's why I chose this example. So we're going to start with one lot of that second pair of brackets plus, help me expand the next part. What are we going to get here? Four, four i x plus four i squared y. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, you're going to get to the point where you're comfortable enough to just go to negative one in your brain after you do this a lot, like you can do it hundreds and thousands of times. But I encourage you, especially on the first line, write i squared anyway. It's a good sort of error checking thing for yourself. So that's, that's the entire left-hand side. You okay with that? And then on the right-hand side, nothing has changed. You just have 6 plus 7i. Now we have tidying up to do on the left-hand side, right? And what I would encourage you to do, remember I said to you, colors are going to be very useful to you. I like to highlight the parts that I'm going to collect together before I start to do that collection. So in the middle, I've got these two bits that are going to become the imaginary component. And then I also have these two bits that are going to become the real component. And I'm going to write that in such a way as to highlight that. So uh, we said this i squared is going to be negative 1. So at the front here, and I'm going to, even though it's kind of unnecessary, but it's helping my brain, right? I'm going to put the real component in brackets. What's in the real component? What's the first thing? That's the easy one. It's just x, right? No change. Then the other bit is going to be minus 4y. Minus 4 why? There is the real component. In fact, I will highlight it for us just by even writing. This is the real component of the left-hand side over here. Okay. And then, just like I have been here, right? I'm trying to highlight the fact that there's an imaginary component over here. So I'm going to say plus i, and then here comes the b, right? Here comes the b. So what do I put into here? Have a think. I'm factoring out i, right? Y plus 4x. Yep, that, that y is hanging out there. I took out that factor of y. And then, and then in here, I take out the i and I get 4x. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Right? And again, nothing has happened on my right hand side. So this thing here is the imaginary component of the left hand side. Okay? But now I'm going to bring in what they suggested to us in the question. I'm going to equate the real part here with this real part here. Does that make sense? Like, there's nowhere else for this 6 to come from. It has to come from these terms. And likewise, there's nowhere else for this 7 to come from than from these terms. So in fact, what I then form, and we should write what we're doing, we should say equating the real and imaginary components. I'm actually going to get a pair of equations, one that looks like this and one that looks like this. But I'm going to fill in the numbers. Yeah. So I'm going to get, here's the real part x minus 4y on the left hand side is going to equal, look on the right, it's 6, right? There's an equation. 
And then I have, I'm going to write it in x's and y orders because that's how I usually do things. 4x plus y equals 7. It's the imaginary part over here and the imaginary part over there. Are you, are you okay with that? So I've just drawn, right, written out the specific version of this for this question. So from the original equation, I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> my, my equations are sprouting, right? I have two equations here, um, but I have to solve them together. What do we call that when you're solving two equations or more together? Simultaneous equations. So I'm going to pause for a minute, because I, I think you can handle this. We've turned a weirdo looking problem with complex stuff into a much more familiar looking problem. It's all just real numbers. We know how to do this. So I'm going to suggest you maybe name these equations and then see if you can come up for some values of x and why. Call, um, call one of us over if you need a hand or you think you've got an answer. Um, if you think you get an answer real fast, go ahead and substitute it back in. That's how we check whether equations, solutions are valid for an equation. Give that a go and we'll see how you fare. Did you get some values for x and y? Yeah. Yep, okay. From memory, I think you're getting an x of 2 and a y of negative 1. Okay, you happy with that? And of course, for those of you who got there real fast, I hope you did come up to this first line, the one we started with. Take this left hand side and then you're multiplying 1 plus 4i by 2 minus i. And if you, if you got it right, okay, you will expand out to 6 plus 7i. Really minor note before we move further, um, because you have this situation with simultaneous equations that guess what? going to happen a lot, right? You're going to try and find a real component. You're going to find an imaginary component. Because you're solving for two variables, you generally need two equations, which is generalizable, by the way. If you had like 15 variables you were solving for because <laughs> you had a death wish, you'd need 15 equations to also solve it. That's how systems of linear equations work. Anyway, one quick note, just because I was looking around at some of the working that you did was, you fairly quickly realize, you're like, oh, this is back to stage five stuff. Like, I've solved simultaneous equations before. You've got two methods or two strategies generally. Your disposal, what are they, by the way? Substitution and elimination. elimination. Did most of you go for elimination? Yeah. Or did most of you go for substitution? substitution? Who went for substitution? Hands up. I'm just curious. And elimination? Wow, really evenly split. Okay, that's, that's fine with me. I suppose... It was easy enough, like you could take, you could add 4y to both sides, you'd have x as the subject maybe, or you did it something similar to here. Um, the only note I want to make, because I, I noticed this as I was going around, whatever you did, you were going to change either one or two in some way to then allow them to interact with each other. For instance, if you went by elimination, which half of you did, you might have gone with this equation here and multiplied it by 4. Yeah, that'd be a reasonable way to do it. You get this. And what you're doing is you're setting up to add this equation with the first one, and then your y's cancel, off you go. Okay? Now, the thing that I noticed a lot of people doing, I'm not writing it because I'm going to encourage you not to, I've noticed several people calling this equation 3. Now, that's, that's not wrong. I mean, it's, it's the third equation. Okay? I'm going to encourage you to do something slightly different. I'm going to encourage you to name this third equation in some way that helps you know where the equation came from. Okay? This is 2a because it came from 2. The reason this is just like a handy extra thing to do, like you won't get into any problems if you call this equation 3, but I've seen students, especially when they are, you know, under pressure, running out of time, in an exam, they're like, here's equation 3, and they substitute it into the wrong equation. Like, they might take equation 3 and put it into 2. Can you see why it's a bad idea? When you sub an equation into itself, you end up with something trivial like 1 equals 1 or 0 equals 0, and you're like, great, but, but like, like, no, that's, that's not a good thing. That's not helpful to me, right? Because substituting an equation into itself doesn't give you any extra information. You've got to substitute into something different. Make sense? Especially when you're going to get more equations flying around, this is going to be very helpful. OK, so we got our values of x and y, and then you can pop them in. Happy. One more piece of um, formal language notation we need to introduce before we go any further. And some of you noticed this earlier than I intended because I accidentally assigned a few wrong questions. We've been talking about um, multiplication by complex conjugates. Remember that? Right? So in the case of this general complex number, our complex conjugate would be a minus ib. Okay? So this ends up being really useful for simplifying stuff out. So because we talk about this guy a heck of a lot, it gets its own form of notation. Right? Anything you use a lot, it's like we should put a symbol on that. So because it comes from this, in the same way that you name it in reference to where it came from, we call this guy z bar. We put a horizontal line over the top. And some of you might have noticed this in the exercise. So this is our notation for indicating a complex conjugate. And 
as you read it out, I'd, I'd say like, this is Z, this is Z bar. You might find W bar or, or Z1 bar or something like that, okay? So what they mean is this. 